Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Monday to you. Uh, I do have a few things at the top, so if you'll just uh, bear with me. I think you may have seen our, our statement uh, yesterday on the terrorist attack in Lahore, but I do want to uh, reiterate it here today that you know, we condemn in the strongest terms uh, the appalling terrorist attack in the gushan e iqbal Park in Lahore that killed dozens and left scores, scores injured, um, and many of them were children, as I think you saw. The United States stands with the people and government of Pakistan at this very difficult hour, and we send our deepest condolences to uh, the loved ones of those killed and, of course, to all those injured. We, uh, we uh, are praying for a, a speedy recovery. Uh, again, attacks like these only deepen our shared resolve to defeat terrorism around the world, and we're going to continue to work with our partners in Pakistan and across the region to combat the threat of terrorism. Um, today at the State Department, at the State Department's International Academy in Bangkok, excuse me, Atlanta Police, Atlanta, <coughs> Georgia Police, with expertise in combating hate crimes, are leading a training on investigations uh, of these crimes for law enforcement from 12 Asian nations. The Atlanta Police Department's participation is part of a State Department effort to tap expertise amongst local U.S. agencies to advance human rights and rule of law and to build capacity to fight crime overseas. The Atlanta uh, Police Department will also conduct similar training for Latin American, European, and African law enforcement at three other overseas State Department-run academies later this year, and we're very grateful for their uh, willingness to participate uh, in this very worthwhile initiative. A couple of scheduling notes. At 2 p.m. today, Secretary Kerry will meet with Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlet Cavusoglu to discuss key bilateral issues, including, of course, the fight against uh, Daesh. And I'll have uh, a readout of that after it's over. In fact, I'll be ending the briefing promptly today so that I can uh, be a part of that meeting. Uh, yeah, it'll be a, ri a written readout, right? Um, and then tomorrow, the State Department will honor a remarkable group of women from around the world with the Secretary of State's International Women of Courage Award. The award goes to women who have shown exceptional courage and leadership in advocating for peace, justice, human rights, gender equality, and women's empowerment. This is the 10th year the department will give this award uh, to mark the milestone of honoring nearly 100 women from 60 countries. The department will host a forum following the ceremony where Vice President Biden will give remarks. So we'll have more to say about that, of course, uh, tomorrow. Matt. Thank you. Um, last week while we were away and the Syrians, backed by the Russians, uh, started their move toward Palmyra and then which is now complete and they've taken it. There seemed to be a little bit of confusion, from what I understand, about whether the United States thought that the Syrian government, the Assad government, taking Palmyra back from ISIS was a good thing or not. Have you guys uh, come to a conclusion about whether or not the get ISIS getting driven out of Palmyra uh, by the sure. Assad regime, helped by the Russians, is a good thing? The short answer is yes, we think it's a good thing. Uh, I'm, I wasn't aware that there was confusion before, uh, but there's no confusion on the Secretary's uh, part in his mind. This is a good thing. Um, it, we, but, you know, we can't forget what Dash did in this place, uh, destroying our common heritage, human beings, our, our, our human history there, beheading a renowned archaeologist who was responsible for maintaining those sites. So we do think it's uh, a good thing that Daesh no longer controls it. That said, we're also mindful, of course, that the best hope for Syria and the Syrian people is not an expansion of Bashar al-Assad's ability uh, to tyrannize the Syrian people. Uh, we all know that over the long term, the Syrian army, under his command, uh, cannot bring peace to Syria. That's the long-term goal. So um, it's not going to... Uh, prove able to retake other, you know, areas deep in other parts of the country, and, and Assad is responsible, of course, for the civil war that um, that has, in fact, helped grow uh, a group like Daesh. But in the main, Daesh not being uh, in Palmyra and not therefore able to continue to decimate human history, yes, we think that's a good so thing. Would you go so far as to congratulate the Assad government for its military success? I, I don't think. Uh, I think I just would characterize it the way I just did. Okay. And then the last one on this, and then I'll someone else can go. Um, you know, the, the Russians have said that their 
prepared to help uh, UNESCO and uh, ag yeah. well, that they're prepared to you know help demine and and help UNESCO with the to get in, yeah. with the a antiquities and the, the historic yeah. um, sites there. And I'm just wondering, is this something that's just com completely out of bounds for the U.S. to assist in while it is the Assad government is is, is running it, or is it something that you'd be willing to consider? For the sake I'm not. Of a, I'm humanity. not. A, I'm not aware of any consideration by the United States in terms of being a part of a, a UNESCO, uh, facilitating the access to, to UNESCO or even participating in a UNESCO visit. That said, and this did come up in our meetings in Moscow, uh, and Foreign Minister Lavrov did express to Secretary Kerry that their willingness to to try to help UNESCO get in there. And again, we would support that. Uh, we would like to see UNESCO even, even if it's while the Assad regime is. In control. We would like to, the, just to be clear, what we would support is UNESCO getting a chance to get in there and, and take a look around. Um, but I don't foresee, and I point you to my Pentagon colleagues who might have, you know, uh, more granularity on this, but I don't foresee, nor have I uh, uh, aware of any discussion about the United States participating in a demining uh, exercise there in, uh, in Palmyra to allow UNESCO to get in. But we would, uh, in general, support uh, UNESCO getting a chance to get in there and get a look at the, at the historic sites there. Kirby, um, I'd like to uh, do you think, I mean, it's a big win for um, the Syrian forces um, backed by the Russians. Do you believe that this uh, win in any way could affect um, discussions on a peace process and specifically a political transition? Um, already the Syrians are saying that they will be willing to take part in an international coalition. So this is this has bolstered um, their confidence um, that they can take more ground. Uh, I, I would let them speak to the degree this may have bolstered their confidence or not. I mean, frankly, we have seen that because of early Russian military activity uh, uh, in Syria, we had we had seen, and you and I, we've talked about the, that the Assad regime felt emboldened by Russian military support. So. Um, that they would feel encouraged by this, I, I couldn't dispute it. I've not seen reports that they have, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, I can't dispute that that might not be the case. Um, but to your broader question on whether it's going to affect the, the, the peace process, I think it's just too soon to know. Um, we just now finished the, the first real set of talks in Geneva because uh, the, the first uh, attempt obviously didn't didn't last very long. So the first real attempt just got completed, and they were there uh, all together in Geneva for two straight weeks. And even Mr. De Mistura noted that that was not insignificant, though there was not a, a concrete proposal that came out of it or, you know, a, a, a meaningful, tangible representation of how the political process is going to look going forward. Certainly that they were able to stay together and, and stay in those discussions for two straight weeks uh, was noteworthy. And we want to see that progress continue to build on. I think it's just, it's very, it's too soon to know the degree to which the Palmyra operation is going to affect it one way or the other. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure that we should expect that it would, um, except as you said, maybe because it gives them a little bit more confidence. But it's, but it's really, it was a tactical operation on the ground that, um, that again, while we welcome the dash being kicked out of Palmyra. We still want to make sure and want to see uh, both sides, the opposition and the regime, continue to stay at this political process and move forward with it. And then um, after the discussions in Moscow, what is the next step? I mean, does the Secretary feel that that has given Geneva an extra boost, as um, Stefan uh, de Mistura had, had hoped for? Um, what, the, the, our discussions in Moscow? Correct. That, I mean, he was seeking some other yeah. um, boost um, to, to yeah. the discussions. What is the next step? Do you, does the does the secretary believe that that has given that ex extra impetus to those discussions? I think, in short, the answer would be yes. And uh, you heard how the secretary uh, couched his discussions uh, with Foreign Minister Lavrov and with President Putin, four hours with each. Um, and you saw him <laughs> as, as he came out of there talking about what they agreed to do. And there was quite a, a a healthy set of agreements between the United States and Russia with respect to moving the political process forward. Um, and that those discussions came uh, on virtually the same day that the Geneva talks ended, I think, um, uh, also would help, I think, can indicate, should indicate, that, um, that the political process itself uh, was, uh, in fact, endorsed yet again by both the United States and, and Russia. So. I think the Secretary felt very 
uh, encouraged by his discussions in Russia um, and uh, encouraged by the agreements that we were able to reach uh, with the Russian government in terms of the political process itself. And, and now we really have to, you know, get down to the business of implementing those agreements and ensuring that they that they actually come off the, the way they were discussed in, in Moscow and that the, the next round of talks in Geneva, A, occur and B, continue sort of a positive trend and trajectory and momentum. Difficult to say right now what the next set of talks are going to look like or what how they're going to end, um, but we are all encouraged that that there is a there is a sense of momentum now in the political process that we haven't seen before, and I don't want to overstate it, but I certainly don't want to understate the the impact of U.S. Russia uh, collaboration and communication with respect to the political process has given it. And one, one last question, but the issue of Assad's future was not resolved. I mean, we know that there were discussions about it. And You're talking about in Geneva. In, uh, sorry, uh, in Moscow. That was discussed, but it was unresolved. Um, if I remember that the, the Secretary had said, we need to ask the Russians to speak on how they're going to push Assad uh, to, um, right. to, to move on the next transition. Given that that is, not, um, that is still unresolved, um, uh, and also given that Dimastura had said that the discussions in Geneva need to move on to that transition. Right. Um, is it possible that that transition or that those discussions in Geneva can move forward with this issue of Assad still unresolved? They have to move forward because it's still unresolved. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. The future of Assad is not settled yet. Um, uh, and the Secretary said, he, sa he said in an interview over the weekend, that the, that the Russians are not wedded to Assad. Um, what what they have ex uh, routinely, regularly talked about is making sure there's that there is some infrastructure there, governing infrastructure going forward, um, not that it has to be Assad. Now, the, the issue of when he goes and what role he may or may not play in a transition is still it still needs to be worked out. And we would like to see, we share, we agree with uh, Mr. Dimastura that in the next round of talks, we would like to see them get to a little bit more detail and granularity on the, the question of Assad. But this is ultimately something they've got to discuss inside the Geneva framework. Uh, and I don't mean the Geneva talks they're having, I mean the, the communique of 2012, inside that framework, that issue of mutual consent, and what does that mean? Um, and they, they've got to work that out. Um, but just to restate it, because I feel like I must, there's been no change on our part on what the, uh, on what the future for Assad and Syria need to be, and we want to move away. We continue to, to believe that he has lost legitimacy to govern, that, that what what the Syrian people need is a government away from him and one that's towards a, um, uh, institutions that are representative of them and responsive to their needs. I'm just curious, I'm sorry, to, but what exactly do you think was noteworthy about the, the talks in Geneva? You said, and this is a quote, I think, there was not a meaningful, tangible demonstration of success, but it was noteworthy. They spent two weeks together. I mean, noteworthy. That what was noteworthy about that? Other than they well, spent a ton of money to, at Swiss luxury Swiss hotels. I would and point you to probably ate very well. I mean, you know. What I meant was that, that that they didn't they didn't solve a particular problem in the political process. Even Mr. Di Mastora said that. Right. But he said himself that the talks didn't break down. That. Well, they, they, they could didn't have, break down. They just didn't accomplish anything. They could have so dialogue. This? It's very early on in this process. But they and, didn't but, have dialogue, did they? But, I mean, it was this. It was pro through in, proximity exactly. talks. Exactly. But, so, but that's still dialogue, even though it's not face-to-face. -face. And what and what Mr. Di Mastura said and what the secretary said in Moscow is that, you know, we would like to see the next step be face-to-face -face talks. But they did come up with a list of, of uh, commonalities, about a dozen or so commonalities. These are ideas, principles that both the opposition and the regime agreed to in terms of, of of the essence of what Syria should be and can be in the future. Like what? Well, we all like breathe air? I mean... Unified, non-sectarian, free of terrorists. I mean, I could get the list for you. It's online. You can look at it yourself. Okay. But there was a list of 12 things that now 
But the listen, regime in the opposition agreed to, but, which had not existed before. But, yeah, but presumably, <laughs> that they, whether they had put them down in a list or not, I mean, they all agreed that they previously, even before the meeting in Geneva, that they agreed that bad things shouldn't happen in, in, in Syria. That's not really any kind of progress. And even you said there wasn't any progress. So I'm just curious. I, I yeah. don't get what – how did someone looking at this, uh, you know, a analyze or – come to the judgment that there is a sense of momentum when you even say that nothing was accomplished except for a, a, a list of things that they probably or they, that they had agreed on already. That's well, uh, again, I'd say a couple of things, Matt. For, first of all, we both know that the, the first attempt failed and only lasted a few days and because of the yeah. continued... Well, I think that's the first time you guys have said that, admitted that it was it was... It collapsed into the it, well. I mean, fact's a fact. I mean, it lasted okay. a few days, and they all left. And part of the reason was because of the, you know, the continued bombing. So, let's look at the short answer to your question: is it is, it is noteworthy and it's significant that they were able to actually conduct a full round of these proximity talks without interruption, and at the end to come up with a list of common principles and ideas. I, I'm not okay. overselling that. I'm right. not overselling that at all. Okay. As I said, we didn't have, you know, there weren't. Even Mr. Dimastura said there wasn't like a uh, a, a tangible um, mark of progress in the political process necessarily, but that we were able to have them conduct these talks without interruption was not insignificant, and that at the end of it they at least agreed to some common principles. And you know, up until uh, maybe, maybe you know something I, I don't, but uh, as far as I know, the regime and the opposition had never come together and agreed to a dozen list of common principles and ideas. The, the opposition had in Riyadh, uh, they had come up with a common set of negotiating principles, but it's the first time that I know in five years that, that the regime was even willing to, even through a proxy, communicate with the opposition on a common set of, of principles going forward for well, Syria. Some of those are like, some of those are like, there shouldn't be any terrorists in Syria. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. I don't think, not even the regime uh, disagreed I, again, with the idea that Syria should again, be unified and secular and, 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 and No, no argument. And again, I'm not trying to right. oversell it. I'm just okay. trying to say that it was, it very, was significant and noteworthy that they had these talks. Very last thing. As you said, the Secretary did say um, several times that the Russians are not wedded to Assad. But that's not kind of, that's not really the point. I mean, I, it, it's, uh, is it – do you have any indication that the Russians are prepared to break up with Assad? They may not be married, but unless – but 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 unless – but in, well, I'm trying to – you. it's wedded is the word here, right, mm -hmm. that he used, that you used. Yeah. It's not really a point of whether they're married or not. It's a question of whether they're ready to break up with him. Is right. there any indication that that is the case? I won't speak for the Russians in that regard. I'm not – I'm not aware of – a quote-unquote indication that they're ready to ditch Assad, but we don't believe that they are so committed to him, the person, that, that they won't right. consider uh, a, a process through which this transition can get to a okay. government away from but Assad. I, you know, I, I, was co I covered Geneva, the first Geneva, and mm -hmm. that was the Russians' position then. I don't that, – that doesn't – now, you haven't swayed them at all. The Russian, the Russian position uh, has been consistent. I wasn't time. arguing that we swayed okay. them or tried to change all them. Right. Nothing's okay. changed about our position. And again, um, you know, we want – ultimately, this has got to be solved. The question of Assad and the future has got to really be solved uh, by Syrians themselves. Okay. New topic? Uh, yeah, we off with – we done from Syria? Okay. Cuba, um, former President Castro had some harsh – comments directed at the United States in the wake of the um, Cuba visit with Obama and Secretary Kerry. Um, in a letter, among other things, he referenced what he called a merciless blockade that has lasted almost 60 years. He talked about multiple attacks of violence, um, mercenary invasions. Um, first of all, what is state's reaction to what he's saying? Uh, we've seen his comments. I, I think uh, I, I – he can speak for himself and his views of uh, – uh, of the troubled U.S. Cuban history. Um, I mean, I, I, but I think I, I would just pivot back to what the president said when he was down there and what we're trying to do for the future. It's, it's uh, the, the, the policies that we had in place for the past 50 plus years hasn't worked. That's why the, the president wants to engage. We want to have eventually normal diplomatic relations with Cuba. We believe engagement's the best way forward. 
Um, but again, uh, Mr. Castro can speak for himself. Is there any concern that this may be a diplomatic setback or an indication that diplomacy is not as rosy as it seems, considering that these comments are coming <laughs> from the president's brother? I've been, what, at the State Department now for 10 or 11 months. I I've never seen diplomacy as rosy as it may seem. Um, uh, it, is, it, is often, uh, it is often a difficult troubled path that you that, that you take um, in diplomatic relations sometimes even with you know with the best of friends there, there can be troubled spots nobody expected that the normalization process with Cuba was going to be linear or easy or quick we all recognize there are still differences uh, human rights being one of them that we still have with uh, with Cuba going forward but the way you we believe you solve di those differences is to engage to have dialogue so the short answer to your question Pam is no um, Mr. Castro can speak for himself and, and his views of both the past and the future of U.S.-Cuban relations. All I can do is, is speak for uh, Secretary Kerry and then reiterate what the President has said about what we want to see for that future. Yeah. On Pakistan, uh, the Lahore terrorist attack, yeah. has there been any outreach to Pakistani leadership from this building? I'm not aware of any specific uh, outreach from the building, but clearly our embassy in Islamabad has been in touch with uh, Pakistani uh, <coughs> leaders there. Uh, in the and country. what's this assessment of the security situation inside Pakistan, or the how strong the terrorist organizations are there? What's this? What's my assessment of the security situation? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that's a better question to ask Pakistani authorities. I mean, it's their country, um, mm -hmm. and I think you know, they should speak to that. And uh, there's no doubt that that Pakistan continues to be under threat uh, from terrorists inside their own country. Um, and we've talked about this before, uh, that innocent Pakistanis, and we saw it again this weekend, continue to suffer at the hands of terrorists inside Pakistan. And we know it's a threat that the Pakistanis take very seriously. They don't need to be reminded um, of the danger from terrorism inside Pakistan. And nothing's changed about our commitment uh, to do what we can to, to help them deal with this threat. Because it isn't just, we saw terribly that it was certainly visited upon the Pakistani people this weekend, but as you and I have talked about before, it's not just a Pakistani threat, it's a regional threat, it's a global threat in many ways. Um, so uh, we stand by the people of Pakistan right now, and we also stand by our commitment to assist Pakistan going forward. So has a uh, Pakistani Prime Minister has also canceled his trip to Washington, do you have to say anything on this? I, I, I wouldn't speak to the Pakistani Prime Minister's travel schedule, that's for them to speak to. We've seen the reports that he's not coming. I think uh, given what uh, just happened, it's completely understandable why he would want to stay at home. And last week <clears throat> when ISIS had attacked Brussels, you had said that they are doing because uh, they are being weakened in, uh, in the parts by the U.S. and its allied countries. Uh, do you simil think similarly in the Pakistan too that the terrorist organizations are on the run? That's why they're going for these kinds of I know that they're. I know that they're under pressure. Uh, this group in particular that claimed the Lahore attack is the TTP, which uh, uh, we know uh, the Pakistani security forces uh, continue to put under, under pressure, um, and quite a bit. Um, but I think it, it, as groups like this get put under pressure, um, it, is, it is somewhat to be expected that they will look for ways to lash out, and, and suicide bombings and these kinds of dramatic terrorist attacks are, are ways to do that. Doesn't mean, and I don't want to indicate that it means that we think the threat's passed or that, you know, that, that they're not still a dangerous group, either TTP in this case or, or DASH is what we were talking about in, in respect to, to Brussels. They're, they're still dangerous. We still have to take the threat very seriously. Uh, but with a group like DASH, which is somewhat different, right? I mean, the TTP is not a, is not a self-proclaimed caliphate. They weren't uh, and haven't tried to sort of set up an alternate, you know, governing structure or to take over the government of, of Pakistan. Daesh is a different beast in that regard because they do value territory possessed. Um, they, they value a revenue stream uh, from what you and I would consider more conventional means like selling of oil um, or, uh, 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 you know, donations from, from foreign uh, donors. Um, and it's a group that had at the beginning sort of a quasi-military characteristic to it, which TTP never had. So they're different groups, different goals, uh, different objectives, but obviously still the same deadly means of carrying out the violence. Well, wait a second. They, they, I mean, you say that, 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 they're, that they're different and they don't seek a caliphate, but 
they, they do, the claim of responsibility that they issued, one, said that they're going to continue fighting until Sharia law is the, you know, the law of the land in Pakistan. And secondly, they said that they had specifically targeted Christians on Easter Sunday. Do you, there's been some yeah. commentary about why you guys uh, didn't mention either the Easter connection or the Christian connection in your condemnatory statements over the weekend and again today. Do you believe the claim of responsibility that Christians were targeted and are targets? I have no, we have no, no indications that their claims of responsibility are false, although I can't sit here and, and no, confirm I, it 100 percent. Right. Therefore, I have no indications that their, the motivation that they claim was the reason is also false. But this is all going to be investigated by Pakistanis. Uh, and, you know, that I didn't mention in my statement that, you know, this was specifically targeting against uh, Christians on Easter Sunday was was as much a, a fact, uh, a justification, uh, much an indication of the fact that it, would, it had just happened and we didn't know that much about the attack at, at, at the outset. Um, is that your understanding now, though? Do you believe that it was? Well, again, we have no reason to doubt the veracity of their right. claims that this was aimed at Christians on, on Easter uh on Easter Sunday, but again, I, I'm not also in a position. I just we don't have the fidelity of information to to actually, you know, confirm uh, overtly that 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 was in fact the case. But clearly, but, well, clearly that certain appe it certainly appears to have been the case, and there and we have no reason to doubt their their claims. Okay, hey, we stay on this. I have a question. Not on this. Um, over the weekend, Secretary Kerry called the Republican primary uh, an embarrassment to the United States um, no he did not okay what did he say he said that he said that he thought the rhetoric particularly as it relates to uh, foreign policy issues and uh, uh, people of other faiths um, was an embarrassment Okay, so I'm not making that big of a leap, am I? Yeah, you are. You okay. said, he, he said you, your, your question said that he called the Republican <coughs> primary process an embarrassment. Okay, not the, prom the primary <coughs> process. The He thinks the rhetoric from the candidates who are seeking office is an embarrassment to the United States. And I was wondering if um, you could expand on um, who might be expressing those concerns, uh, which, which foreign leaders... Uh, are expressing concerns, what they're asking him. If you could just expand on that a little bit. I'm, I'm not going to give you a list, but I can tell you, as, a, as he did, uh, virtually every foreign leader that the secretary meets with expresses concerns about the campaign rhetoric here in the United States and expresses a fair bit of angst about where things are going uh, because these, these, these comments don't, don't necessarily – uh, in many cases reflect uh, certainly the Secretary's view of our foreign policy objectives or in many cases our own values as Americans. So they have virtually all of them have expressed that concern and he said so. And as for exactly what they said and what particular comment uh, uh, they were referring to, I'd let them speak to that. Do you get the sense that they're referring only to Donald Trump or do you think that they're also referring to Ted Cruz or other candidates seeking Republican nomination? I think there is a wide swath of views that have been expressed on the campaign trail uh, from more than one candidate that has uh, that has caused uh, concern among many foreign leaders. Does that mean only on the Republican side? I'm, I think I'll leave it at no, I think no, I'll leave no it at, foreign leader has expressed concern about the <laughs> rhetoric in the Democratic I think primary. I'm just going to leave it the way I said, and, a wide and, swath of candidates. And, is, and does it apply only to when, when he hears the, and says that it's an embarrassment, does that apply only to the foreign policy rhetoric, or is there other rhetoric, personal insult, or is that also what he was referring to? I think just largely, largely he's talking about some of the foreign policy comments, but I, I, I couldn't rule out that there are uh, other comments made, not foreign policy related, that, that has caused an eyebrow or two to raise overseas. Sure. And such as? Well, I, I think, again, look, I, I'm not going to, I, I don't want to debate the specific. No, I'm not here. asking you to debate. I'm just saying, no, I mean, I, what, what, I, what did people I just, raise? Did they I, say? I think, I, this wife thing has gone too far, or you know, I, you know, we can't understand why. What, what, I think that what, all what broke. Are, what that all broke issues? after our trip, uh, so I don't. I don't know that he's been asked about that. I, I again, I'd really rather not engage in in specifics on the campaign rhetoric, but but I think again, 
pulling back to what he said, that the, the rhetoric, um, uh, the very stark rhetoric right. uh, that continues uh, to emerge from the campaign is not being is not being ignored by foreign leaders and foreign governments and frankly foreign populations and. Um, as the secretary said before, we you know public officials should be mindful right. when they make but those it, comments. Well, but 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 again, it's only on the Republican side that he's heard about this. Right? I, mean, well, the, the people I, I think I'm just going to leave it as I no, said. Why swap? Just, just to be clear, I think he made that point. He was. We're not talking about the Democratic side. He was not talking about the Democrats. He was in that did. particular instance. Uh, no, he wasn't. Yeah. But it's not affecting. It's not affecting other countries' policies towards the United States or yet. I mean, they've just expressed concern. Correct. There's no pullback or defense not, positions. N nothing that, nothing that I, I've seen or we okay. can point to, no. Uh, you want to stay on this topic? Yes. Go ahead. Um, in particular, there were comments over the weekend about um, South Korea and Japan uh, pulling out troops there and uh, allowing South Korea and Japan to have nuclear weapons. Um, can you address those and what the Secretary I, I, might As I said before, I'm not going to get into an engagement on every comment made by every candidate. Nothing's changed about our the seriousness with which we take our treaty commitments to Japan and to South Korea. Nothing's changed about our view of what the future of the Korean Peninsula needs to look like in terms of denuclearization. Um, and again, nothing's changed about the uh, support we're going to continue to give to the government of Japan as they work through, you know, th their own review of uh, of their defense posture and and uh, and again how we can help them how how we can help them in that regard. Nothing's changed about our views of those two very very important bilateral relationships. Can I stay on Japan? Japan? Yeah, uh, Japan's national uh, security laws that will allow Japan to exercise self-defense uh, correctiveness will take effect tomorrow. Do you have any response? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. I'd let the Japanese government speak to that. <laughs> That's really for them to speak to, not, I, not for us. You, you, don't yeah, have any, uh, you don't have anything. Uh, how would you comment uh, on the latest killing in Ukraine? Ukrainian lawyer Yuri Grabovsky was kidnapped and killed. Using, there's information that he was killed uh, using explosives and so-called controlling shot. Yeah, I've just seen these reports. I'm going to refer you to Ukrainian authorities to speak to that. Um, we, we're just seeing them uh, uh, like you are, and it's just too soon for us to draw any kind of, kind of conclusion here or, uh, or to make any overt statement. Uh, we need to learn more from Ukrainian authorities about it. Do you have any concerns regarding this case? Uh, do you consider this killing as a political one? Or? Uh, again, you're asking me to comment on something that just happened and we're still trying to get more information about it. Obviously, it's concerning to us, these reports, um, and we need to learn more and know more and, uh, before we're in a position to speak to it. Yeah. Turkey? Uh, just once, <laughs> when I call on you, I would love to hear you say something other than that. Is that going to happen? I hope. Yeah. One day. Uh, so for a few, <laughs> for a few days. And then ask a question about Turkey. For a few days, uh, in Turkey, uh, media known to very close to current government uh, have been accusing U.S. government uh, for attempting to overthrow uh, Erdogan government. These allegations and claims uh, have been voiced by at least half a dozen newspapers and dozens of uh, other uh, reportings. Uh, my question to you, does Are we the U.S. government the government try to control question? their uh, It, our it is such a ridiculous claim and charge that I'm not going to dignify it with an answer. The uh, fact that they, these are the media known like uh, Soviet Pravda is very close to uh, uh, Erdogan government. There is no way the editorial can be run without the, uh, President <laughs> Erdogan and the government's uh, knowledge. How, how do you uh, 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 command with the ally countries uh, uh, this kind of allegations? to do another ally country. I'm not sure I understand what allegation you're talking about. The allegation that, that because they're run by the government, they have to editorialize mm -hmm. pro-government mm -hmm. comments, or the allegation that we are trying to overthrow the Erdogan government? These allegations of overthrowing Erdogan government coming directly from the media very close to the uh, President Erdogan, uh, who is supposed to be here 
tomorrow or the other day. I, I don't care who it's coming from. It's ridiculous, and it's, it doesn't merit a response by the United States of America. Uh, we're we'll back here. Back here. Just, just one more. I am so sorry. Just this one one's more. on Mozambique, though, right? <laughs> Next time, hopefully. Uh, uh, over the weekend, last Friday, uh, about 10 uh, uh, diplomatic missions uh, visited journalist trial on Friday. Yeah. Uh, including, I believe, American uh, yes. uh, diplomat there and the president, right. uh, president Erdogan have been basically saying that this is not your business. Uh, would you comment on that? Do you stand by by your diplomatic? Y yes. And, yeah, there were U.S. representatives uh, uh, at the opening of this particular trial, and that's completely in keeping in, uh, with uh, standard diplomatic practice to observe and report on uh, political, judicial, and other developments in host countries. This is not only not the first time, uh, but it darn sure won't be the last time that we observe these kinds of uh, these kinds of judicial proceedings. Um, personally, I, we regret that this case is now being tried in in the public. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in private, without the public or media uh, or diplomatic access. Um, uh, so that's regrettable. Um, and number three. And you've heard me say this before. We continue to urge the Turkish government to abide by its commitments, enshrined in its own constitution, to the fundamental principles of democracy, including due process, judicial independence, and freedom of expression, including freedom of the press. Okay. Yeah, you had one on Turkey back in. Yes. Both of you guys? Oh, I don't know. No, I do. <laughs> My question will be on Iraq. Oh well, then I'm not going to go to you now. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I'm waiting for Mozambique. So, um, Turkish President Erdogan will be in D.C. this week, and President Obama has no plans on a one-on-one -on -one meeting. From the State Department point of view, um, has the relation with uh, Turkey changed since uh, his last visit to D.C. in 2013? Well, the, I think the short answer to your question is, is no, but I mean, I'm not aware of you know, back in 2013, how we characterized it. Uh, look, they're a NATO ally, a strong partner in the counter-dash coalition. And in about 12 minutes, I'm going to have to get upstairs because the Turkish foreign minister is going to be here for a bilateral meeting with Secretary Kerry. Uh, this is a very important bilateral relationship to us. We take it very, very seriously, as we know the Turks do as well. Uh, there is an awful lot to talk about. Uh, we've talked before that we don't always agree on everything. Media freedom is one of them. Uh, but that's the strength of a healthy relationship, when you can disagree and still have, you know, productive discussions about the things that you that, – that, that are common threats and challenges, such as terrorism, such as Daesh. Um, so we look forward to the discussions going forward. And how about the, uh, the way they're handling the situation with the Kurdish uh, separatists? How is the U.S. regarding that? The Turkish separatists? Yeah. You mean – are you talking about the uh, Kurdish fighters on the other yeah. side? Of the, what, we, look, we're, we, there's no doubt we're going to talk about uh, the situation uh, in Syria and about that stretch of border that continues to, to, to provide an avenue for foreign fighters and supplies to get to Daesh across their border. But um, uh, w w obviously, uh, the, the Turks have concerns uh, about this, and uh, we continue to look forward to having discussions with them and engage with them on, on those concerns. I mean, we, we understand they still have those concerns. Our view, and I've said this as recently as last week, we don't accept semi-autonomous, uh, self-declared zones in, inside Syria. That's not going to change. But, you know, we'll, we'll see how the meeting goes, and I'll certainly give you a readout after it's over. But this is not a new topic of discussion. It's not a new issue or, or area of concern by Turkish authorities, and, and we look forward to continuing to have a dialogue with them. Iraq? Uh, yes. The, uh, the Iraqi Prime Minister, Mr. Alabadi, has been pushing ahead for reform in his government, and he claims to reshuffle his whole cabinet. I was curious about your position on these claims the body has been trying to accomplish. I, what you call claims, I think, are, are in fact, uh, you know, almost it makes it sound like, you know, he's doing something wrong here. Prime Minister Abadi is, Prime Minister Abadi is trying to make necessary political reforms in his country, and he has moved some officials around, and that's that's the obligation. That's the responsibility. Those are the choices that a prime minister has to make. We continue to support his efforts um, uh, to uh, to improve governance in Iraq and, and to enact uh, uh, appropriate reforms to try to facilitate that process. But bringing what he calls technocrats into his cabinet, this 
Mormon would definitely make a lot of people angry because he's going to exclude a lot of party party appointees into his government. How would you react to that? Again, these are decisions that he has to make um, and his government has to make and the Iraqi people have to make. And those are internal decisions that we aren't going to involve ourselves in each individual uh, appointment that he makes. Um, uh, th th these are internal matters for uh, Iraq to speak to and for him to speak to. In general, we support his efforts at reform and we support his efforts at trying to get uh, a government in place and keep a government in place uh, that can be responsive to the needs of the Iraqi people and can help them deal with a very real threat inside their own country. They're represented by Daesh. So wait a minute. So, the, so this is <laughs> the position of the U.S. is that you're not going to interfere in the uh, president or the, 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 the leader of a country, his choices are a cabinet, but you will interfere in who the, or if you will, you will choose who should be the leader of the country. But once your selected person is in power, they can have whoever they want in the cabinet. Is that basically what? Well, I'm that, it was the Iraqi people that, that, that. Yeah, after put you guys, Prime Minister Abadi, in a, the position a, a, he's in. After the U.S. pulled the rug out. We're not, we don't involve ourselves in the internal decisions of an electorate like that. Except in Syria, and. No. How, how's that? I'm not sure I follow how we're doing that in Syria. Yeah. I want to follow up on Japan really quickly. Okay, uh, well, I'm pointing at you. <laughs> what, what? Change of topic? Not yet. What? You, you go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll, the, come, I'll come back to you in a Okay. Second. The LA Times is reporting that the investigation into former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's email server is reaching its end stage. And federal prosecutors are commencing interviews of all the, or some witnesses. To your knowledge, are any state deport department employees being sought out for interviews. I wouldn't speak to details of an FBI investigation. Oh, the email. Is it your you understanding that, that the investigation is nearing completion? You should talk to the Federal Bureau of Investigation on, the emails. on that, not, yeah. not us. Can you outline the drain of resources this investigation has caused um, and now has it passed since all the emails have been released? I can't talk about a, a quote unquote drain of resources on the investigation. You'd have to talk to investigating agencies. For the Department of State, that. sorry. Uh, well, our role has been to produce the actual traffic, uh, the, the email traffic that former Secretary Clinton turned over to us that she believed were of a professional nature. And we've done that now. Uh, and we started in May and we just finished it up. So several months of work and effort. There was a lot of manpower put into it. I can't quantify that for you now. If you really need to know that, we'll take the question and try to get you a way to you know, quantify the effort. But it was a sizable effort and it, it, it took many man hours to complete. I can't speak to the status of the investigation. That's just not our role. Would you, do you welcome the conclusion of this investigation? I, I, I don't. I, I can't speak to whether it is reaching a conclusion. So again, you'd have to talk to the FBI on that. That wouldn't be our place to speak to it. Japan. On the emails. Uh, as my have... um, as my colleague previously mentioned, uh, Japanese new security laws took effect a few hours ago. Uh, do you have any comment on how this might affect the U.S.? No, I, I just don't have an update for you on that. I mean, you're going to have to let us. I, I, you said yourself, it just happened a, a, a few hours ago. So I just don't have I don't have anything for you on that. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to see uh, about well, getting back. but the back laws here. were passed a, a while ago. It's just the enactment that's new. I, I just I don't, I don't have anything for you right now. Yeah. Okay. Have you heard about the Google tool from 2012 uh, designed to track and map defections within the Assad government? Do I know of a... Uh, a Google tool from Google 2012 tool? designed to track and map defections within the Assad government? No, I'm not uh, aware of it. Hillary uh, Clinton's team at the State Department was aware of this, and from her emails we learned that before Google launched that tool, Google's Jared Cohen who had previously worked at the State Department, wrote to Secretary Clinton's team to ask for guidance. He wrote, quote, nobody is visually representing and mapping the defections, which we believe are important in encouraging more to defect and giving confidence to the opposition. Given how hard it is to get information into Syria right now, we're partnering with Al Jazeera, who will take primary ownership over the tool we have built. State Department's Jacob Sullivan forwarded this whole idea to Hillary Clinton with a note which said, FYI, this is a pretty cool idea. Do you think it is a pretty cool idea to get a media company to take ownership of a tool designed with a specific foreign policy goal in mind? You're asking me to speak to content uh, on emails, and I have uh, 
very religiously steered away from speaking to the content uh, of this email traffic, and I'm not going that. to divert today. I understand that. My, my, my question is more of a, of a general kind. Would you? Do you think it's a good idea to get? I, a I media? can't. I, I can't. I can't answer your question because I don't know. I've not seen that email traffic. I'm not going to speak to the content of it, and I'm not going to speculate on whether that was a, a good idea or not. Uh, specific, not not on these specific emails. Uh, putting that aside, generally, do you think it's a good idea to get a media company uh, take ownership of a tool designed with a specific foreign policy goal in mind? I can't answer your question because, you're, it's, once again, it's a terrific hypothetical that I refuse to engage in. Um, I can only tell you that, that uh, we do the best we can through a variety of means uh, to, to learn more uh, about, uh, about some of the populations with which we're dealing with from a foreign policy objective or from a foreign policy perspective. Uh, but I can't speak to this particular uh, issue that you're talking about. Understood. Folks, I got to go. Has, I got to go. Uh, I've answered your question, ma'am. It's your a question. different one. Ma'am, got to go. Thank you.